Morning, everybody. Um, I'm just waiting a few seconds there while the other people in the waiting room are admitted. So before we get started, I might just ask everybody to mute their microphones, uh, if that's okay. Thank you. Okay, so I'd like to welcome everyone to, to this morning's event um, entitled Empowering Women in the Triple Helix Model. So this event has been co-organized by the IEEE Women in Engineering UK and Ireland Ambassadors Programme and Confirm um, Smart Manufacturing Research Centre based in uh, University of Limerick. So I'm, I, I'm a member of staff in Confirm, so I might just give you a quick overview of the centre. So we're a Science Foundation Ireland funded research centre, as I said, based in Limerick. Um, carrying out research in various areas of smart manufacturing and related technologies. So we have a few speakers from Confirm on the, on the call this morning. Um, so really looking forward to hearing the presentations. And again, thank you all for joining us uh, this morning. So the format of today's event, we'll have uh, two keynote speakers, followed by 13 lightning talks from, from speakers based around uh, in different institutions who I'll introduce during the call. Um, that will be followed by a short Q&A session. So I'd, I'd encourage everyone in the audience to submit your questions either via the chat function um, or there will be a chance to ask live questions during the Q&A session as well. But please feel free to use the chat function uh, to submit questions during the presentations. Following that, then there'll be three breakout sessions. Um, uh, the first track is Cybersecurity in a Connected World, and that's being chaired by Dr. Lubman Luxney. Uh, the second track is Smart Infrastructures and Devices, which is being chaired by Dr. Susan Ria. And the third track is Intelligence Centers, which is going to be chaired by Dr. Nagam Saeed. So when the breakout sessions are about to begin, you'll get a pop up on your screen and you'll be able to select which breakout room you'd like to join. So that'll be for 15 minutes. So uh, that's pretty much the housekeeping taken care of. So I'd like to pass you over now to Dr. Nagam Saeed from the IEEE WIE Ambassadors Programme, who's going to give you a little bit of an introduction to the event. So Nagam, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Sean. Hello, everyone. I'm Nagam Saeed. I'm one of the committee members of Women in Engineering, IEEE, United Kingdom and Ireland section. I'm also the lead for Ambassadors Network. I would like to welcome you for our joint program with Confirm today. Our mission in IEEE UKI Women in Engineering is to facilitate the recruitment and retention of women in technical disciplines globally. IEEE Women in Engineering envisions a vibrant community of IEEE women and men, collectively using their diverse talents to evade for the benefit of humanity. As a committee, we offer mentoring opportunities, especially to young women who are thinking about careers in engineering, computer science, and the pure sciences. IEEE mission is to build bridges between industry and academia. Therefore, the Ambassadors Network has established programs to expose the audience to novel areas and aspects of engineering and computing, which solves real world problems, uh, they've got they establish programs to uh, link for networking and mentorship and also to uh, establish links with industry and to create uh, connections for research opportunities. I would like invite, uh, to invite our ambassador, Dr. Lubna Lakshmi Dhurhani, to talk about the motivation behind today's workshop in more details. Lubna. Okay. Thanks, Nagam. Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, thank you very much for joining and being a part of IEEE Why UKIN Confirms Empowering Women in the Triple Helix Model event. One of the key takeaways I had from IEEE Why International Leadership Conference this year um, as a speaker was a hashtag women supporting women. And that truly moved me. And that's when I decided to organize an event which brings forward women from different areas of expertise a platform where women encourage, inspire, motivate, and support each other. I believe events like these will bring forward today's and tomorrow's talents together and reduce the gender gaps that exist within STEM in academia and industry. Thank you very much. And looking forward to your insightful keynotes and talks. And I hope the audience enjoys this very much. Hashtag women supporting women. Back to you, Sean. Thanks, Lovna, and thanks, Nagam, for, for those overviews. Um, so I suppose without further ado, uh, we'll kick off the, the, with the first keynote speaker of the day. So I'd like to introduce Professor Dana O'Shea, 
who's the Chair of Cybersecurity in Munster Technological University in Cork. So Dana, over to you. Perfect. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see that, Dana, thanks. And you can hear me, okay, perfect. Um, so let me just start my timer. Uh, so first of all, I just want to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to participate in today's Women in Engineering event. It's a privilege to be here and it's also a privilege to be giving a keynote speech. Um, I want to start off with talking about my career and provide an overview of my career to date. Um, sometimes I feel like I've had a career of first and I'm going back now to when I was a child and we were the first six class group to graduate from a brand new national school in Balnadee, which is a really, really tiny village in the middle of nowhere um, in, in West Cork. And this was back in 1989. Um, prior to that, Hurleys in our schools had to, a dual purpose, one for killing rodents and the other for actually playing Hurleys. So we were in a brand new school and it was a real um, milestone event at the time. In 1990, we were the first ever first year students to go into another brand new school called Colossian of Tiberta in, in, in Bandon. And this was back in 1990. And in 1997, we were the first ever leaving surf group and the first ever intake into college that received really true free college level fees. When I went to college, the college fees were basically 250 euros a year, and that lasted for about a period of about eight years in, in, in the Irish, Irish higher education sector. And in 1997, that was the first ever intake into a brand new program in Munster Technological University called Software Development and, um, and Computer Networking. And when I was doing my master's, I had my first child, Avril, um, and in the middle of, um, of my uh, education. I was the first ever female to join a software development team in IBM in 2008. Um, and I was also the first member of that team ever to say that I'm pregnant and I'm going on maternity leave um, in 2011. Um, in 2012, I actually joined MTU and there was nothing first about that. I joined as an assistant lecturer and I was assistant lecturer there for three years. And then I was promoted to lecturer and I held that position for three years. But then in 2018, I was the first ever female head of department in computer science in the Faculty of Engineering and Science in, in, in Munster Technological University. And I now hold the position, um, which is basically uh, the HEA Sally Chair of Cybersecurity. I was the first appointee nationally um, to hold this professorial level post and I've been holding it for the past um, year. What I want to say is that being first isn't what it's cracked out to be. Um, that's what I will probably tell you first. Um, I don't want to be paving the way to change. I want to be, the, you know, the fact that I'm female is irrelevant. Um, a normalized regular event in, in career. Um, I'm not really interested in, in, in breaking glass ceilings. I'm only interested in doing my job and doing the job. I'm doing my job to the best of my abilities. The fact that I'm a, a woman really needs to be made irrelevant um, and, and I hope it is going to become less relevant as I progress my career onto the next levels. Um, I want to talk about empowerment and you know the whole team of this event is empowerment and you know empowerment is a process of becoming stronger and more confident especially in controlling one's life and claiming one's rights and I want to talk here about the confidence piece and all of this and the confidence piece I think really is a critical part in actually empowering women um, to embark in this triple helix, you know, to be able to work confidently across academia and industry and, and government. And the reality is, is that, you know, we are operating in an environment where there is a gender gap, both in terms of pay and leadership opportunity for women in engineering. Some argue that this is because of inflexible workplaces, other believe it's because of sex, sexual or sexist cultural norms or, or even outright discrimination. Over the past number of years, there is another theory that has emerged, and this is commonly referred to as the confidence gap. The theory is that women feel less confident than men in, in their own abilities. And I want to talk briefly about my own confidence and my experience of it. First of all, I believe confidence is a journey, a journey that I'm still on. Um, I have taken several blows to my confidence over the years, and it has taken a lifetime of professional experience to understand the bit about how it all actually works. Before I actually started my career in ICT, I studied nursing for a year. Um, and the year I spent nursing was based in the old model of training on the wards because I'm basically around that long. 
Um, and my first two placements actually in nursing were very positive experience, but the third placement was very different and was very different because the sister in charge was very demanding and she was very demeaning to junior nurses to point where one day when I didn't actually do something correctly, um, she decided she would lock me into a cupboard uh, for punishment. And I remember being in the room or the cupboard, which was a, a pretty large cupboard you now to bear in mind. And I was wondering what I was going to do next. I was wondering whether I should accept the behavior, go back to my job, my tail between my legs or walk off the board or the incident to the training manager. And when she opened up the door after my punishment, um, I looked her in the eye and I walked off the board. Um, and the courage I had in that moment is something I've reflected throughout my career. Um, and I've wondered sometimes where that girl actually went to. Um, I didn't have any real life skills of actually to draw on, yet I had the courage and the confidence of knowing what was right or what was wrong. And I want to talk about what real courage looks like. And real courage is Dr. Sheehy Shepperton, who was really the foundation stone of why I am in the current position and holding this professorial level position of, as chair of cybersecurity. And Dr. Sheehy Shefferton presented a complaint that NUIG discriminated against her on the grounds of gender regarding her promotion to senior lecturer. And the Equality Tribunal ruled in 2014 that she had been discriminated on the basis of gender and should have been promoted to the post of senior lecturer. And her case put down a marker for the importance of gender equality and promotion at third level institutions in Ireland. And her impact can be seen today through the work overseen by Mary Mitchell O'Connor and the HTA through the, through the Senior Academic Leadership Initiative. The, and, I, and I hold the position because of this woman's courage. Dr. Shefferton said, we're sick of being scrutinized to find out what's wrong with us. The issue is with the system and the way men are being promoted. And this is actually true. This is, was, was a four fundamental problem. I just wanna talk about the advice and comments I've received over the past number of years. I've, been, I've received comments of, just be more confident, be more ambitious, be more like a man. I've also received comments, you're very ambitious, and this hasn't been said in a very good way. Um, I have received comments that you've only got the job because you're a woman, and we need you for gender balance in various panels. Comments like this have really shown me how we are constantly being blamed for leaning in when we actually show confidence. And when we actually do show confidence, we're also being blamed um, for showing male-like levels of confidence. And confidence for me is, is not a feeling. It's, it's a set of behaviors that I've changed over time. Confidence is an outcome. It is a result of constant practice. It is a dividend of encountering the unexpected and dealing with it over and over again. I started my career with courage, but I want to end it with confidence. Confidence is the ability to recognize, yes, I am nervous but I won't let my nerves control me. And I've learned over the years to draw on my expertise and my competence and use this as a strength to build my confidence. Sorry, there was some, someone talking in the background. And I want to talk about something that room, room really destroys confidence and it's this rumination process. It's about, and rumination is thinking about things over and over. And I have spent half a day going through the things that I have done wrong during the day, items that I have not completed, things that I may have been taken out of context. This ruminating process always takes place when I try to go to sleep. Um, and I have used tactics, uh, music, meditation, medication, um, to discard these thoughts. Um, and what has amazed me is that my husband, who could basically has a very, very similar job, could actually just hop into bed and he never suffered from this process of rumination. He never experienced any of these thoughts. He just went to sleep. And when the head of department position was actually advertised in the Faculty of Engineering and Science nearly two and a half years ago, it was my fear of rumination that nearly prevented me from applying for the position. I was worried that I would not be able to handle the increased pressure and responsibilities of the role, managing a department of a thousand students and 55 um, full-time members of staff. And I did go for the position. And in that role, I never had the opportunity to actually think about things over and over again. The reason was there was so much stuff actually being thrown at me. I never ever had the time to actually ruminate and, you know, actually go through that process ever again. And I wish someone had told me that, you know, in order to stop the ruminating process, you just need to be made busier and put under more pressure. 
So I just want to end this presentation with a quotation that was actually um, Linda Doyle met and made, and she's the first prophet, female prophet of Trinity uh, College Dublin in its 430 year history. And she said that leadership is about service rather than about power. And for me, leadership is about service. I want to ensure that Ireland is more prepared for major cybersecurity incidents. I want to engage with industry to ensure that we have the right people with the skills to defend our networks. I want to make sure that Ireland maintains its competitive advantage as a safe place of do, doing business. I want to build a team with the skills and the confidence to be future leaders. And I want to demonstrate it as possible to lead with integrity, to be born vulnerable, to have courage, to have confidence, and to empower other women to be whatever they want to be. And that's my goal as HA Sally Chair of Cybersecurity. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dana. That was a really, really inspiring and interesting presentation. It's great to hear about your the way the way you progressed through your career to date. And um, so next, the next speaker, our, our next keynote speaker is uh, Dr. Susan Ria from again from Munster Technological University. And Susan is the research group lead in the Nimbus Research Center based at MTU. So Susan, I'll hand over to you. Lovely. Thanks, Sean. Uh, just two seconds now, and I'll share my screen. Uh, Zoom and I have somewhat of a fractured relationship. We're either fully on or fully off. So hopefully we're working together today. Um, so get this to work. We'll try again. Okay. Everyone see that okay? Yeah, I can see that now, Susan. Thanks. Great. Uh, looks like we're having a good day today. So um, thanks very much to Sean and Love uh, for the invitation here today. And, and much like Donna, um, I'm delighted to be part of this event. Um, when I'm invited to speak at events like this, I always think it's a great opportunity and, and I'm very appreci appreciated, appreciative of the, the invitation. And I suppose it goes back much like Donna, um, maybe if I can take a moment to reflect at the start of this conversation. So when I started engineering, 20 odd years ago at this stage, um, there, there wasn't any women. There was 120 people in my class. And I think there was probably two to three women. And out of that, I was the only one that, that finished. And I suppose it was an isolating experience. Um, it can be lonely. You're on your own, you know, to, to, to some extent. No, I made great friends. And I'm friends with some of those people um, to this day. But you know, at the end of the day, it's good to have some female support, you know, it gives you a bit of confidence, etc. And I suppose it can harden you somewhat, you know, you have to, to be prepared to, to face the criticism on the basis of your gender. Um, I looked around me, I suppose, my colleagues were pale, male and stale, it was older white men with outdated opinions that uh, were often misogynistic. One of the, the workshop practicals that we had was off campus, the bathroom facilities were male only. So if indeed you did need the bathroom, you had to trek across campus and be fairly quick. Um, so, you know, you were an outcast from the start and it, it, it wasn't a great experience, um, I suppose. No, I was surrounded by good friends and for the most part, the, the lecturing staff were, were excellent, I must say, but you are an outsider. You're that outlier that we're always trying to figure out what is that problem in that particular experiment that we have this outlier. So you're, you're an outcast. But I'm glad to say in the 20 or so years through my career, we're seeing a different world. I'm no longer surrounded by pale, male and stale. I'm glad to say we are now surrounded by um, a diverse group of people and it has benefited my own career. Um, it's made for much more rewarding work, much more engaging conversations, et cetera. So um, I'm hoping with events like this, we continue to build that community. And Lubna talked about women supporting women. And I'm glad to say now we have communities where everyone is supporting everyone. And I need, I, um, I firmly believe that we have to continue on this journey and we have to continue to support each other. And I suppose, the motivation for, for today's talk was described to me in the context of focusing on women who've developed successful careers in the field of engineering and science and technology. And we were talking about leading by example. So for the words that struck a chord with me were leading by example, and that inspired the title of today's talk, Words Are All We Have. So this is a quote from the Irish playwright Samuel Beckett. So for me, 
Words are powerful, and we must think of the consequences of our spoken words. So one said, you don't know the longer term impact of your words on those around you. So we have to make sure our words count. And we have to make sure people understand our stance with respect to the words that we're using. So as part of today's talk, and it goes back, I suppose, maybe some of the things I experienced and some of the things I try to address now in, in my own leadership style, etc. I wanted to talk about how we use our words to push back on gender bias, how we use our words to be an ally in the workplace, and how we can lead by example through our words. So some of the things I would have heard over the years, and now I vehemently try to push back on. We talk about bias, and there's lots of conversations today around bias. And for example, within MTU, I deliver unconscious bias training myself as part of our Athena Swan activities. So influences such as our background, experience, environmental conditions, they all play a part in shaping our choices, influencing our opinions, whether we realize it or not. So for the most part, this isn't a major issue. But we can display unconscious bias when we favor or discriminate against people because of these influences without even realizing it. And gender bias is a behavior that shows favoritism towards one gender over another. And I'm reiterating some of the points that, that Donna made. And I think it's important. Expert opinion tells us that we overestimate men's performance at work and underestimate women's. Women have a harder time than men proving they are qualified. And women face criticism when they appear to be ambitious. So when we hear bias, we must use our words to push back and challenge the biases, including challenging our own snap judgments. And we're all guilty of this. As I said, it's unconscious for the most part. So we have to challenge ourselves through the use of our own words. So when we hear a colleague being referred to as being aggressive, we must see it for what it is. She is in fact being assertive. When a female, when a female colleague is described as not being tough enough, we have to ask, are men tougher? If so, how? When we hear a colleague being described as not having enough experience, then we have to question it. What is the relevant experience that she is missing? When a female colleague is called out for being bossy in the workplace, then we have to talk about her leadership skills and her ability to lead and demonstrating leadership. And my particular favorite and one that has been leveled against me and I'm sure will be again in the future, she's awkward. Why are you awkward? It, in my case, it's typically because I'm asking the hard questions. I like to get to the bottom of an issue. I speak when I have something meaningful to say, and I'm not being nosy. I like to get to the bottom of an issue. I want to know why it's happening, and so we can prevent it from happening in the future, etc. So I'm not awkward. I just want to get to the bottom of an issue. So again, I reiterate the point. When we hear bias, we must challenge it. And how do we challenge it? We use our words to challenge bias. So if you're in that position or if you see a colleague in that position, and if you're able, I would ask that you call out these biases. Allyship in the workplace. And this is something we're beginning to have lots of conversations around. And I think it's very important and it's something we must understand. We must understand what to be an ally means. So again, we have to use our words to be active allies and take responsibility that will help um, take responsibility for making changes that will help others to be successful. So I think that's the sign of a good leader is you build up the people around you. So as Donna said, it's not about power. We're talking about supporting and empowering. So through your leadership, you must bring your team with you. We must call out times that women are interrupted. So think about your own experiences. How often have you been in a meeting? You're making a point and a male colleague will jump in and often reiterate your point and they get the credit for it. So if that happens again, you have to call out that. You have to say uh, that goes back to the point that Donna made, for example. You know, uh, be, in a, uh, be confident in calling out um, in support of your colleagues. This is how we demonstrate allyship in the workplace. We must not let single, often male voices dominate the room. We must acknowledge and endorse the good ideas that are put forward by colleagues from unrepresented groups and not necessarily always female groups. There are other unrepresented groups within our workspace. So think about those people and think about how you can support them and give them a voice in the workplace. We have to call out behavior or speech that is degrading or offensive and explain why you are doing this, where so everyone is clear about why you are raising the issue. So through our words, we can lead by example. So the 
theme of today is empowerment. So how do we empower our colleagues within the workplace? So as I mentioned at the start of my talk, we now recognize the importance of diversity and inclusion in the workplace. The benefits are well documented and they include driving creativity, innovation, and the bottom line in terms of boosting profits. Increasingly, this has led to corporations examining the policies regarding female empowerment with regards to strengthening female leadership and setting clear targets for representation at senior management levels. So what do we have to do to drive female empowerment in the workplace? We must actively encourage women to seek promotion, take risks and go after opportunities. We need to start, drive and continue these conversations. We must create new roles for women and look towards positive action to address the gender gap. Um, Donna referred to the, the senior academic leadership initiative. So that was an excellent initiative in the form of positive action that was undertaken by the HEA to address female representation at senior management level within the Irish education sector. We need equal pay for equal work and equal experience. So we all hear that for every dollar a man earns, a woman approximately earns about 79 cents. This has to stop. If you're doing the same job, you deserve the same pay benefits and credit. We need to create safe workplaces and prevent harassment of any type. We need to support flexible working arrangements. We all have responsibilities outside of the workplace. A nine to five is not typical and not suitable for everyone. So we need to recognize this. We have seen how work practices have successfully been adapted during COVID. So now is the time to continue to embrace changing and flexible work practices. So we need to keep these issues front and center and we need to keep the conversation going. So I'll, I'll come off my soapbox, but I, I suppose I just wanted you to think about your words. And for me, um, maybe to try and, and illustrate the point, if you think of a ballerina, so what comes to your mind when you, when you say ballerina, you think about typically graceful, beauty, strong, athletic, powerful, but underneath that ballet shoe, you don't know what that person's foot is like. Often it's bruised, broken, taped up, et cetera. And it's taken a hammering through years of dedication to their craft. So much like words. So while everything may appear calm and beautiful on the outside, you actually don't know the effect that your words are having on the inside of a person. So when you're talking about someone or talking to someone, think about those words. And I think in today's society, we have to think, we have to think about the power of our words. And for me, these days, I suppose I keep in my mind, I'm trying to use my words for the betterment of others. So I would like to leave you with the, the point that as empowered women, we must use our words to empower other women. So thanks very much for the opportunity to speak. Thanks a million, Susan. Uh, again, a really, really uh, powerful presentation. I think re really important messages that we can all take away um, there from your, from your talk and from yours also, Donna. So thanks very much to both the keynote speakers. Um, so I suppose now we're going to move on to the, uh, the first of the lightning talks. So I just need to share my screen here. Um, and first, the first speaker we have today is Dr. Valeria Nico from the University of Limerick. So Valeria, I'll hand over to you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Sean said, I'm Valeria Nico uh, from uh, Stokes Laboratories of the Bernal Institute. Uh, today, I'd like to uh, show you how vibrational energy harvesting, so the conversion of vibration into electricity, can be used to power IoT sensors for industry, industry 4.0 application. So Sean, if you can move to the next slide. So uh, if we consider a temperature sensor, for example, it can be represented as uh, four building blocks. So we have the powering system that is made up of uh, batteries and uh, wired uh, power, for example. We have the electronics that can be a conditioning circuit uh, and a micro microcontroller. We have uh, the sensor itself that for a term uh, temperature sensor is a thermocouple, for example. And we have the transceiver to uh, transmit uh, data, uh, the data of the temperature. So uh, IoT analytics uh, estimated in 2020, so last year, that uh, there will be 30 billion uh, of IoT devices uh, connected by 2025. 
and uh, most of the device of these devices uh, are actually battery powered and this will create some issues with the widespread of IoT technology in industrial settings, especially if we consider that all these batteries need to be replaced and discarded. So, Sean, if you can move to the next, thank you. Uh, so, uh, batteries, as I mentioned, uh, need to be replaced before their expected lifetime to uh, ensure that the sensor will never uh, be offline. And uh, in uh, factories where large networks are present, uh, the facility manager could end up ch changing up to 30 batteries a day. And uh, this is not uh, feasible because it means that there will be a person in charge of just changing batteries. Uh, moreover, batteries have also a significant uh, environmental uh, hazard for two factors. Uh, the main one uh, is because uh, batteries and rechargeable batteries in particular are generally sealed into IoT devices. If you think of uh, your smartwatch, you can't uh, replace, the, you can't change the battery if uh, the battery fails. That means that the whole device has to be disposed, increasing uh, uh, the pollution of the environment. Uh, the other factor is that uh, currently we are uh, recycling only uh, less than half of the batteries we are importing, uh, we are putting on the market. So, for example, in 2019, only 47% of uh, the batteries placed uh, on the market in Ireland were uh, collected by We Ireland for recycling. And this is uh, a very bad uh, effect on the environment. So uh, if you, Sean, if you can move to the next slide, thank you. Uh, so my uh, vision is to uh, create self-powered IoT devices that uh, could operate indefinitely. And this would be possible by uh, replacing the powering system. So in particular, replacing the batteries uh, with uh, energy taken from the ambient. So uh, next slide. So. Uh, this energy uh, can be solar energy, uh, thermal gradient, uh, power from the wind, and also uh, vibration. So um, by converting the energy from the ambient, it is possible to sustainably power IoT devices, reducing the overall environmental impact of uh, the device. Uh, next slide. As part of my research, I developed a multimodal vibrational energy harvesting technology that could uh, use the vibration of uh, industrial machinery to power small uh, sensors. The technology uh, showed the best in class performances by exploiting relative movement of magnets and coil. Uh, the harvester can provide a stable 3.3 uh, volt DC uh, that is uh, suitable for a range of IoT sensors and communication protocol. So to uh, show that it can, the device can be uh, used to power sensor um, in the next slide, uh, I'll show you, sorry, yeah. Uh, I, uh, I considered uh, uh, two different uh, sensor boards. So a lot of one board developed by the SF SFI testbed uh, performance nation and a commercial uh, Bluetooth uh, low energy board. And uh, I uh, use the vibration of an industrial air compressor to power uh, these two sensors. So uh, for the LoRa one board, I could achieve a transmission of 30 seconds, while uh, with the Bluetooth energy, I was able to uh, achieve a transmission of uh, two seconds. And these uh, two transmission rates are uh, quite uh, fast, considering that with uh, lithium batteries, uh, if we want to achieve all, a one-year lifetime, we uh, have to uh, transmit at least uh, every five minutes. So you can see that uh, by using vibration, it's actually possible to power uh, um, sensor node with uh, the same transmission rate that you would achieve with batteries. So uh, to conclude, if you, Sean, if you can move to the last slide, uh, the biggest takeaway uh, of my presentation is that it is possible to provide a sustainable alternative uh, to batteries by using energy that is present already in the ambient 
and this will allow for the creation of uh, fit and forget IoT nodes that could be easily deployed towards in locations that are hard to reach. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Valeria. Uh, that was a really, really interesting presentation. Um, in the interest of time, we're going to move on straight to the next speaker. Um, excuse me. So next up, we have Dr. Vern Cam from again from the University of Limerick. So Vern, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, John. Thanks for inviting me to this wonderful conversation. So um, my name is Vern Cam, and today I'm going to talk a bit about uh, and a project that is ongoing on our research lab. So we are fabricating sensors. Um, for particularly for medical applications. So these sensors are for monitoring physiological parameters in a clinical environment. Next. So you, uh, to give you a sensor overview, as you can see in the, as shown in the picture here. So we develop a portable sensor system based on a novel combination of both 3D printing and optical fiber based technology. So um, our focus, research focus is to develop a sensor that is capable of monitoring spine bending and also for respiratory monitoring. So it's basically a motion sensor. So for the sensor system part, as you can see on the figure on the right here, we use, utilize an Arduino Mega board as a um, controller board. And then we develop our own um, PCB circuit board for data collection and ADC conversion. So this data collected from the sensor can be sent, can be stored in the SD card itself, or can be sent to a PC through a Bluetooth module. Yeah. Can I have next next slide, please? So, so to give you an overview of how, how we use our sensor that we develop. So, and on the figure on the left here, you can see a 3D printed POF sensor, which we fabricated using a 3D printed technology combined with a fiber optic sensor. And then we place it side by side with a biometrics goniometer, which is a commercialized um, spy bending monitoring sensor just for a fair comparison. So we, we mounted both side by side and we tested on 18 patients in, a, in collaborative project with a physiotherapy space in UL. So our sensor is capable to measure bending direction in both lateral bending, which is left and right bending, and also sagittal bending, which is a flexion and extension. So you can see that our sensor is small and because it's all plastic, so there are no electrics trickle component within the sensor prop itself. So it could be used in a special environment such as in X-ray or MRI scanning environment. So uh, this is just one of the sample results um, from one of the volunteers comparing the sensor from our 3D printed POF sensor and also the biometric goniometer. So they are actually in, in a good agreement in terms of um, bending trend. So we, which shows that there's a potential in, in using this sensor in the clinical environment. Uh, next, next, next. So because uh, our sensor is very sensitive towards motion, so the, sen the same sensor can also be used as a respiratory monitoring sensor. So rather than mounting at the lumbar spine region for spine bending assessment, so here we can attach it anywhere at the upper body of the patient to monitor the respiratory rate. So uh, in this example here, we are comparing it to a commercial respiratory monitoring sensor, which is called a new lock respiratory respiration monitoring belt. And uh, this is just one of the sample results showing a good agreement between these two sensors. So, so each peak here represents one breath. So um, by counting the number of peaks, overlapping peaks here, so, so it, it shows a good, good agreement with a new lock respiratory sensor on the breathing rate. So because uh, the sensor is kind of small and lightweight, so it could be attached anywhere on the body, even at the back of the body to monitor the, the respiratory rate. So we, we also use this sensor uh, to take a few other measurements such as um, different type of respiratory signal, uh, breath holding, um, deep breathing and so on. So next. Thanks. So uh, just a, a short conclusion that um, because our, our sensor is light and small, so it has a potential in min miniaturizing the sensor. And it also could be used for a long-term monitoring. So in future, it could be developed such as 
the, the data collected from the sensor can be sent to a PC or to a physician for a long-term monitoring. So other than um, the current optical fiber sensors that I have discussed here, at the same time, we also comments, recently comments on a new project, H2020 project, which where we focus on developing a range of sensor for patient dose radiation monitoring. So the sensor is used for two modality for brachytherapy treatment, dose monitoring, and also for external beam radio, radio therapy. So just to talk about this project. So the, the title of this project is uh, Optical Fiber Sensor uh, Dose Imaging for Adaptive Brachytherapy. So for this project, we focus on developing a 3D dose imaging and also source localization platform using a multi-point sensor. So uh, that's it for me. Thanks. If you have any questions, you could email me or collaboration um, opportunity. Feel free to email me at wuncam.ul.ie. Thanks. Thanks, Sean. Thanks so much, Vern. Again, an excellent presentation. Really, really interesting uh, work that you're doing there. Um, so again, just in the interest of time, I know I'm kind of, <laughs> we're flying through the speakers here, but in the interest of time, we might just move on to the next speaker. Um, so next up, we have Reno Mohandas. Again, Reno is based in the University of Limerick, and she is a PhD student. So uh, Reno, I'll hand over to you um, whenever you're ready, please. Thanks, Sean. Uh, so uh, I'm here to present my um, project on the topic artificial intelligence and resource constraint devices. Uh, so next slide. Um, as an introduction, I'll, I'll present here about a view of the area that I'm working in. So artificial intelligence is a broad uh, uh, group of techniques which are used to automate intellectual tasks normally performed by the humans. And among the artificial intelligence techniques, we have uh, machine learning is a subfield where you have the, uh, uh, where it is uh, tightly related to mathematical statistics. And one another subfield of the machine learning is deep learning, wherein we use artificial neural networks to, pro it, it, uh, to generate the uh, techniques for uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, so in deep learning, if we have to consider is that it has a deep neural network. Uh, it has to con it has to contain more than three layers of uh, neurons in there. Uh, so that's uh, that's the thing. And uh, the framework used for practicing deep learning and TensorFlow, PyTorch, etc. Uh, so that's the essence. And uh, next slide. Uh, so uh, what what is deep learning used for? Uh, so here I'm using deep, deep learning in cognitive vision. Cognitive vision refers to goal oriented computer vision system, which uh, translates as understanding the uh, understanding an image which means we have to uh, we can identify the objects of interest uh, particularly in the uh, image uh, it can be as general as a cat dog horse uh, car truck etc or uh, or a person or it can be as specific as who the person is or what the person is doing so this uh, type of detections can be further used for uh, surveillance or access or just granting uh, in, into a facility or people counting or such kind of applications. Um, next slide. Yeah. Uh, so um, this is my particular area of in interest that is uh, AI on any resource constraint device. Uh, when we consider a resource constraint device, it can be um, what we are considering here, is, here may be a single board computer. Uh, so this can be, uh, this even we call even when we call it a computer it does not come with the display or uh, it does not have a camera attached to it but the the one shown is the, uh, is another module camera module which has to be separately attached to the simple board computer and uh, it has it is resource contained because it has limited memory in case of uh, it has just uh, only 4 gb ram or 32 32 gb memory hard drive so I'm very sure the smartphones we are holding on to have a very high spec than this uh, single board computer we have here. Uh, so we were able to uh, integrate the deep learning model into the uh, um, into the single board computer, and we could achieve highly accurate detections and identifications that I've uh, discussed earlier. And uh, it was it was nearly real time because the detections took less than uh, three milliseconds. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, so uh, what is the application of such a system in real life? So during the time of COVID, mass face masks were mandatory in, 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 uh, to access every facility. So, um, so uh, I had been working with the, uh, with the project where we had to develop a face mask detection system. 
So this system was developed to be uh, uh, placed at an entrance of a facility, uh, say in case of a lab. Uh, so you have you have the person standing in front of the camera and, and the system has to identify if the person has a mask or not. If a person mask, has a mask, then it'll be ac granted access and if not, they are not granted access. Uh, so, and uh, even the uh, even when the person comes in front of the camera, the date and uh, exact the time uh, were also captured and recorded for the particular person. So it was it could be later used for uh, um, contact tracing. Uh, then the system was developed on three stages. The first stage was developed in the GPU, where it has to be where the deep learning model were trained using a huge uh, number huge data set, and the second stage. It was a camera module where, where the system where the person has to uh, stand in front of the camera and the image of the person is captured and this captured image was then later sent into the single board computer and um, uh, and where where the detection takes place and if the detection is uh, uh, whatever the, the decision after the detection is it was sent into the display uh, so uh, that's a, a project that i've been working on so it was a real life application project and as a conclusion, next slide. So uh, even though the uh, artificial uh, intelligence takes uh, analogy from uh, the neurons and uh, brain in the human brain, uh, but it is uh, uh, still far from human level general intelligence. Human brain is much faster, learns much faster from uh, a limited amount of data. And as we say, the data set uh, for training and artificial intelligence uh, is, is, uh, it is, uh, it, there be, we need huge amount of data and ethical issues of data is also to be considered. But we should be, uh, but we can understand from such a project that uh, when we use AI responsibly, it can still be used for solving real life problems. Thank you. And uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, for presenting my work. Thank you very much, Renu. Again, uh, excellent presentation. So thanks a million for, for your contribution there. And um, just moving on so to the next speaker. Oops, sorry, there's some references there from Renu's talk. Uh, so I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Daniela, Daniela Jacopino, excuse me, uh, from Tyndall National Institute. Uh, when you're ready, Daniela. Thank you, Shane. Great, great. Um, the sort of name pronunciation was great. <laughs> nobody, nobody gets it usually, so thanks. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about electrochemical sensors and in particular point of care electrochemical sensors. Um, if you go to the next slide, Sean. Um, so electrochemical sensors are uh, small devices um, that are usually uh, that comprise usually a sensing unit, as you see on the left, and a very small miniaturized, usually handheld uh, readout system. Uh, the sensor unit, unit it works usually as a kind of cartridge that slots into the system. And uh, um, the whole system allows um, individuals um, to basically monitor their state of health and well-being by analysis of um, uh, human fluids like blood, saliva, uh, urine and tears. Um, the reason why these devices are called a, a point of care uh, sensors is because the um, analysis can be done at home by individuals and the readout is uh, readily, uh, can be readily obtained by a mobile phone. And uh, the results of the analysis can be then through internet communicated to uh, doctors or uh, hospitals and, and they allow then fast uh, decision make making related to obviously the outcome. Um, these uh, objects are becoming more and more um, uh, common and, and they really allow uh, the identification of biomarkers associated to many uh, diseases like, for example, um, uh, heart, uh, uh, heart diseases or Parkinson, Alzheimer's, uh, even cancer. And therefore they are great to allow early diagnosis and also good uh, management of diseases without kind of, I suppose, clogging up the, the health structures. Um, so usually uh, these uh, um, the sensor units are made uh, by uh, rigid uh, substrates, and this is where my interest is. But with the advent of uh, printing electronics, these objects are becoming now flexible, bendable, and even stretchable. Um, and we, uh, well, we, we work on this technique called laser-induced graphene, which allows to write through, with a laser 
the sensi unit of the of the sensor and then we work in collaboration with other colleagues in Tyndall to uh, interface the sensor with electronics and um, the whole thing could could become could become now bendable and therefore um, the sensors can be directly applied on the skin uh, of people to uh, allow monitoring of um, biomarkers, for example, on sweat. And again, the, 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 the fast readout through the phone. Um, the issue with these devices, as uh, Valeria already mentioned, is this: uh, they will become more and more, they are becoming, they are already popular and they will become more and more popular. And the plastic uh, used for, for the uh, sensors is usually not biodegradable. It's usually, in this case, it's usually polyamide capton tape. So our interest is to uh, make these devices more sustainable, uh, if you go to the next slide, actually, Sean, and to substitute um, the not uh, biodegradable plastic with uh, plastic derived from natural resources. Um, so we have de developed some formulations based on chitosan, which is a biopolymer derived from shrimp shells, uh, which allow to laser print, uh, laser write the, the sensor on this, uh, uh, on this bioplastics. Uh, the sensor then has already uh, shown uh, electrochemical activities, like in this, this uh, graph shows the detection of um, ascorbic acid. Um, and, uh, uh, therefore, and then after measurements, the, the sensors can be either dissolved in water or uh, can be composted. Uh, uh, as well as the sensor, also the fabrication technique has a low carbon footprint. And so the ambition, if you go to the next slide, so the ambition for this is the creation of a green sensor unit from sustainable, sustainable materials. Uh, there are other sustainable materials as well as the chitosan made uh, derived from cellulose. Uh, but also the great ambition is to extend this to other um, parts of the sensors. So the circuitry, for example, the, the, the communication to make then uh, a full integrated sensor uh, made from sustainable material. So that's me. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, thanks a million, Daniela. Uh, again, uh, fantastic presentation, really, really interesting work. Uh, so thanks for that. Um, so moving on to our next speaker. Sorry, my PowerPoint froze. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Mevish Rashid. Uh, Mevish is based in the National University of Sciences and Technology in Pakistan. So Mevish, I'll hand over to you whenever you're ready. Thank you, Sean. Uh, thank you for um, um, directing to me. So. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm sitting in Islamabad, Pakistan, and you can hear Azan in the background. And uh, something religious uh, is of uh, something that is of religious importance to us. Um, are you all able to hear me before I begin? Yeah, we can hear you, Mavis. Yeah. Very well. Okay. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, we are four hours ahead of you here. We have evening, but it's morning at your end. Um, I'm truly thankful. Um, IEEE, uh, WIE, uh, uh, UK and Ireland section for giving me an opportunity to deliver this talk and uh, on keeping the open source uh, software momentum going. In the next slide, uh, the overview of the problem is given. So open source software today is uh, ubiquitous. It powers application in virtually every domain. And it's not, uh, its economic impact has been estimated at many billions of dollars per year. Um, in terms of both direct reuse value and boosted productivity and efficiency, sustaining this critical public resource is of um, utmost societal importance. So not only this, but also that, that open source Software has proven to be a safe, uh, reliable source of production, quality software for many industries. OSS provides users with flexibility of choosing technology uh, best suited to their requirements. And the solution created with OSS are cost effective, uh, royalty free, and allow many different organizations to participate in the uh, quality assessment and development of the technology. So, um, um, and the structure of work is 
that uh, the workforce in open source software uh, projects are free to leave on their uh, discretion, uh, leading to sort of a knowledge loss. Um, so knowledge loss here is the loss of uh, skills and expertise. Um, turnover has been observed in OSS projects uh, due to the transient nature of workforce, um, which overall threatens the sustainability of OSS projects. So when an author of the code leaves, um, as you may all be knowing, like when uh, the main co-owner of the code leaves, uh, it follows with productivity loss, uh, because for the person who is coming in place, it takes them a some time to acquire the knowledge and to kind of get back on the maintenance task. And uh, due to this reason, uh, there's a decline in software maintenance. And at sometimes you cannot find a person who can do this task of maintenance. So uh, it increases uh, the code abandonment. Uh, it increases the number of reported defects uh, in the repository. Um, so from this discussion, we can establish that maintenance plays quite a specific role, uh, quite a significant role actually in uh, project evolution. Okay, so on the next slide, I show the solution to the problem. Um, so mitigate the problem of knowledge loss, uh, which has been explained in the last slide. In OSS projects, our recommendation is to implement knowledge retention uh, model, uh, which is classified uh, mainly under five categories, uh, namely core development uh, environment, ecosystem culture, um, communication is the third one, governance and leadership, and contribute and motivation. <clears throat> so a uh, knowledge retention model can be applied uh, to assess the improvement, knowledge exchange uh, mechanisms in OSS projects. Care models should also be part of fundamental, fundamental documents in OSS projects, including um, project guidelines, manual for uh, onboarding newcomers, and uh, knowledge management manifesto. Um, and also I would like to uh, bring into your attention that knowledge management is a, a new field in OSS. And uh, so far not much work has been done. Uh, I was the first one to do a PhD in that area. Um, so on the next slide, I explain uh, the relationship between OSS and industry for um, uh, to keep the uh, momentum of OSS going. Um, so open source communities are not ready to provide uh, production technology for manufacturing industry and industry for. Open source will provide um, the key building blocks that will promote interoperability and flexibility that are required by industry for solutions. Uh, for example, Eclipse IoT Working Group has uh, projects uh, that are applicable to Industry 4. Uh, Apache Software Foundation is another example. Um, Linux Foundation, among others, also have relevant technology to Industry 4. So adoption of KR model in OSS projects uh, is imperative at this point to keep the OSS momentum ongoing in the form of continuity of maintenance uh, tasks leading to software evolution and further to support uh, Industry 4. So thank you for your kind attention and I welcome discussion, thoughts and research collaborations. Thank you so much, Mevish, uh, again, for a great presentation. <laughs> um, uh, so thank you very much for that. Uh, so moving on to the next speaker, um, I'd like to welcome Jacqueline Kyo from Munster Technological University, please. Hey, good morning, afternoon now, everyone. I'm just going to give you a brief overview of the educational design framework, which we've developed as part of the uh, Horizon 2020 project, Fit for FOF, Making Our Workforce Fit for Factory of the Future. Next slide, Sean. So as we're all aware, globalization and digitalization is changing the nature of manufacturing. This is resulting in gaps in knowledge and know-how in the workforce. Current training and educational solutions are discrete are often disassociated from work activities. Thus, Europe faces considerable challenges in addressing future skills needs in a timely and effective manner. To help meet some of these cha challenges, 
the Fit for FOF project has developed a novel educational and training solution for advanced manufacturing, placing the worker at the center of the training design process for the first time. We want to help recognize the influence and the impact of the worker and the success of an organization and amplify their voice in the upskilling process, thus empowering them in their upskilling uh, pathway. Our consortium has a broad array, array of partners, including four educational institutions, five industry partners across eight countries. In helping us draw upon a broad range of industry, we have two cluster organizations who work with a variety of SMEs, a large multinational medical device company, and a large white goods manufacturer from uh, Romania. So the co-design process that we implemented, uh, next slide, is uh, based on a design, the collaborative e-learning design method, which was developed as part of the Learn at Work project in 2007. Our design process consists of a tripartite design workshop with educators, business representatives, and learner representatives all partaking. Outputs from the workshop provide the building blocks for the training development, including learning objectives, physical resource recommendations, and delivery methods. This makes the training program development faster, and the input from the learner is more aligned to their final work. Next slide. One of the other key things that we learned throughout the project is that the uh, training is not just uh, influenced by what the work is to be done at the, at the call face. So you have to have representatives from all levels of the organization involved in the upskilling process. To support this goal, we identified the various stakeholders and what they can bring to the training and development process. It's really important that these goals are representative throughout the workshops so that the upskilling is directed and suits the needs of the entire business. So next slide. Um, obviously, the advent of COVID-19 had a huge impact on manufacturing and face-to-face -face interaction. And this limited our access to uh, shop floor workers. So to circumvent that, we went online. We adapted the process so that we split it into small workshops that suited the online environment. And we made use of tools such as Miro to facilitate the idea sharing and the discussions. This new training design process has proven very effective and very positive feedback from all of our pilots. Our projects will finish at the end of this year and the design framework, including instructional videos, will be available uh, at the end of this year, at the end of December or early January. Um, the other thing is we actually have an event tomorrow, a knowledge exchange uh, event online, uh, and I'll put the uh, link to that into the chat in a few minutes. Or if you want to learn more about the project and what we were doing, contact me or you can check out our website, fitforfoff.eu. Thanks very much, Sean. Thanks, Logan. Thanks very much, Jacqueline. Uh, and apologies for the technical glitches there. I skipped ahead a slide or two. Uh, no bother. <laughs> but thank, thank you for the, it sounds like a really interesting project. And thank you very much for your, the overview. Um, so moving on to our next speaker, if I can get my PowerPoint to work properly for me. Uh, so I'd like to welcome Dr. Fiona Boyle um, from uh, Munster Technological University uh, based in, in Kerry. Um, so Fiona, whenever you're ready, I'll hand over to you. Great, thanks, Sean. So hi everyone, I'm Head of Department STEM, uh, Director of the READY, the Rethinking Engineering Education Ireland project here at MTU. And today I'm just going to give you a very brief insight into the, into the READY project. Um, so I suppose at READY we're aiming to set the agenda for engineering education nationally. And we're going to do this by co-designing, co-developing and co-delivering engineering programmes with industry. And this really starts with our pilot Bachelor of Engineering in Mechanical and Manufacturing Engineering Honours programme. Um, that we're currently developing and the first students are going to be starting with us in September 2022. So next slide there please John. Thank you. Um, so Ready is essentially a triple helix collaboration model across government, industry, universities and their associate, associated research centres. Um, there are a number of key objectives for the Ready project. Um, firstly we want to provide engineering graduates in areas of identified skills needs for the manufacturing sector in Ireland. Um, secondly, we want to future-proof our engineering graduates with the industry-relevant skills they need for emerging technologies. 
So this is where uh, embedding immersive technologies into the ready engineering degree, degree comes into play. So students, for example, will not only learn using the immersive technologies, but they'll also learn then how to use these technologies for engineering purposes for when they go into the workforce. Um, thirdly, we want to promote about transversal skills in our engineering, pro engineering programs, and this is going to produce more rounded, flexible and adapted in, adaptable engineers for the manufacturing sector in Ireland. And finally, we want to draw on national and international best practice in the field of engineering education. So I suppose ultimately the aim for the aim for us is to produce engineers of the future for Ireland's manufacturing sector. And these are engineers that will be capable of navigating all the future challenges and the disruptive technologies that they're going to face in, in, the, in the manufacturing workplace. Next slide there, please, Sean. Okay, so this is a very simple illustration of what the Ready framework looks like. And essentially we have developed three uh, central three pillars in the framework. So pillar two and three, pillars two and three are really what an engineering student will learn. And pillar one is how our engineering students will demonstrate competency. So with pillar one, um, it's called projects. So our ready student engineers will be on campus for the first two years of their program where they'll set, they'll, they'll be set a number of project challenges they'll have to work through in teams. Then in the final two years of their degree, students will go out and into industry and they'll be working on exciting, exciting projects with our industry partners while they'll also be engaging in online learning with MTU. Then pillar two is um, called planning and reflective practice. And this is really the central pillar or the spine that runs the whole way through the program. And it's where students plan out what they need to know and when they need to know it as they progress through the degree. So this pillar really is where um, a student actively figures out what they need to learn before and during their projects. And then after the project is finishes the student, then will reflect back on what they learned and how they applied it and also what they might have done differently. Next slide there, please, Sean. So the pillar three then is really around technologies. So first of all, in this pillar, we have immersive technology. So that's virtual and augmented reality. And we're embedding these throughout the Ready Engineering degree. The images here on the left just give you an idea of the um, amazing custom built immersive technology facility that we have in the North Campus MTU Kerry that our Ready student engineers will have access to. Um, there are, I suppose, those of you that don't know, there are so many different advantages for using immersive technologies in engineering education in particular. Um, they can be used to amplify learning and engagement and retention. Um, it has been shown the technologies being embedded in engineering education programs have shown that there's a greater knowledge acquisition by engineering students. There's a deeper understanding of engineering concepts and also it helps to improve transversal skills for engineering students. Also, VR and AR gives students the opportunity to stim simulate potentially dangerous scenarios in a safe environment. And another advantage, but by no means the last advantage, is that the technologies give student access, students access to simulations, allowing them to, to constantly repeat them and master them as well. The other piece of the Pillar 3 in READY is um, our adaptive e-learning Topic 3. So this is on the right hand side of the, of the slide here. And this is basically the curated knowledge tree that houses all the learning topics um, from the foundation engineering topics in year one, all the way through to the advanced engineering topics in year four. And this is a resource that, that ready engineering students will have access to from when they start the ready degree all the way to when they complete the work placement at the end of year four. So, Michelle. so from our work to date on developing the ready framework with our industry partners, we know that the time the application of knowledge learned during their, their studies is key. And this is where the online top tree and our project centric learning comes into play. So it really is about allowing the students to learn just in time, not just in case. We also know that immersive technologies are providing a huge amount of advantages for application in engineering education. And with these technologies already being adopted across the manufacturing industry as part of routine design and production processes, it's now up to us in academia to follow suit and equip our graduates with these emerging skills. So to conclude, um, we know that the pedagogical techniques are changing in the digital age, and at Ready, we're going to utilize these techniques to produce an engineering workforce of the future for Ireland's manufacturing sector. So if you're interested in hearing um, more about Ready, Please get in touch with me, fiona.boyle at mtu.ae, or you can follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, or check out our website at www.ready.ae to find out more. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks very much, Fiona. Uh, again, it sounds like an excellent project. It's really related to my own work and Confirm as well. Uh, so thanks very much for the overview. Thanks. thanks. So next up, uh, we have uh, Dr. Lubna Luxmi Dirani. Um, Lubna is based in the University of Limerick as well. Uh, so Lubna, I'll hand over to you whenever you're ready to, to begin. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Um, and you can hear me, right? Hi, Sean. We can. can Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we can hear All you. Right. Sorry. All right. So today I'll be talking about demystifying cybersecurity standards for Industry 4.0. Next slide, please. 
Uh, well, one of the things that has, um, with the increased cyber attacks and threat landscape, one of the things that have gained my attention that, you know, despite of implementing cybersecurity standards, why is this happening? Well, looking at the, you know, statistics, barely 11 to 12 percent of industries implement cybersecurity standards or some sort of uh, security policies, and this is why it leaves a wide gap open for vulnerabilities and cyber attacks. Okay, then what happens to, to those industries who actually implement cybersecurity standards? Why is their environment being breached? Well, um, it, it all depends on how they identified and assess their risks in the first place. So there are a number of a number of standards we can say ISO 27001, we have IC 6443, we have different uh, 1M2M, we have NIST standards. So, you know, it's, it's, it's standards are, it, there needs to be a perfect combination, they need to be aligned, they need to be assessed. So what industries do, they basically pick up their best practices and they try to implement it. But when you implement something as it is and you do not customize it based on, and based on what, how your environment is, you leave the gap open and then it, it, it's open for future cyber attacks or potential cyber attacks to happen. So in my research, um, I, I have um, provided a roadmap on how to analyze um, the gap analysis between um, the IT and OT, the two um, pillars in Industry 4.0, the information technology and operational technology. Now, both of them have two different types of standards. They have different standards which need to be converged, aligned. Now, the teams that look after standardization and security, they have different preferences. Um, in terms of um, and priorities in terms of security, such as operation technology looks more into um, the uh, availability of security, whereas the IT looks more into the um, looks into the confidentiality aspect. So just because of this, this type of uh, there's still a big gap that remains that needs to be bridged. And what is important for industry to understand here is. Uh, one model doesn't fit all. Each industry, like in, in terms of smart manufacturing or industry 4.0, we're not just talking about physical factories. We're talking about factories that can be remote, uh, that can be um, in part type of structure, which can be implemented anywhere. Um, so in, in terms of having these type of, uh, you know, um, uh, intelligent and smart environment, we need to align. And um, the paper that I mentioned here, I've provided a roadmap to identify, analyze, assess, validate, and provide a whole roadmap um, based on designing your cybersecurity strategy blueprint based on an industry's vision. So it's mapping. So maybe let's say if we're talking about the chemical um, industry, it would have a different cybersecurity blueprint. And when we're talking about a production environment, it would be different. So creating that sort of understanding so that the, it, it mitigates these types of security issues and breaches. Next slide, please. So over here, I've uh, highlighted uh, my, uh, I worked um, on a two-year project, which is a JNG Johnson Johnson project, um, which is called Securing Machine to Machine Communications and Intelligent Manufacturing Machine and Control. And in this, I designed um, um, a draft blueprint for uh, securing the Industry 4.0 environment. The second uh, project I worked on is aligning a manufacturing standard, Six Sigma standard, into a cloud computing environment. And I aligned IT, cloud, and uh, manufacturing standards together, designed a framework to mitigate security issues based on the cloud environment. My research areas are uh, basically standards, IT, OT, cybersecurity, cloud, communication standards, identifying ga uh, gaps, analyzing uh, um, and aligning standards. And um, more of my exposure has been towards industrial IoT, Industry 4. And uh, if, if this is something um, um, that would uh, that is of your interest, I'm, I'm open for potential collaborations in this setting area. And um, if you want to know more about my uh, the roadmap and my work um, in this area, you can find it on ResearchGate and um, on Google Scholar. And thank you very much. That's me. Thanks very much, Lubna. Uh, thank, thank, thanks for that presentation. It's really, really interesting. Um, so just, just to remind everyone in the audience, if you have questions for any of the speakers, you can pop them in the chat. I'm monitoring that in the background and we'll get to Q&A um, after the last speaker, just to remind you that that option is available. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Lubna. Um, so moving on to our next speaker, I'd like to welcome Dr. Hazel Murray. Um, Hazel is based in the Munster Techn Technological University, excuse me, in Cork also. So Hazel, whenever you're ready, I'll hand over to you. Hi. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, something I did as part of my PhD research, and I was generally looking at authentication security, but as part of it, I looked at it for a bit about password advice. Uh, next. So we're all familiar with password rules such as these. Uh, they're frustrating, 
but we usually assume that there's some security benefit with them. And it actually turns out that a lot of these password rules that we're so familiar with contradict best practice, offer little protection, and sometimes even reduce security overall, usually by annoying users so much. Um, next. So I started this research by collecting password advice and recommendations given by security blogs, multinational companies, and public bodies. And one of the things we noticed is the amount of contradictions in the advice. So um, we collected nearly 300 pieces of advice and we found that 41% of them contradicted each other. Uh, so we wanted to know whether it was possible to quantify whether a piece of advice is beneficial. So we looked at the security benefits uh, advice can offer, and we looked at the costs of implementing the advice, and we tried to see whether it's actually effective advice or not. So I'm gonna just explain this if you go to the next slide. Uh, for the one piece of advice, which is your password must expire. Um, and I'm gonna try to explain why this is not beneficial advice. Uh, next. So in order to explain this, uh, there's two types of attacks that are relevant. Um, the first one is online guessing, and this is where someone goes onto the website and they try different combinations of your username and password, uh, except that instead of a person, it's actually next, <laughs> a bot. <laughs> and ideally, we'd hope that there's going to be some limit on the number of wrong guesses that can be made. Um, next. Uh, so the second type of attack then is offline guessing. And so I've got like, you know, passwords stored with MySpace and Neopets. And uh, these websites basically have accidentally leaked the password files that contain all of their users' passwords. And at this point, we're hoping that they've at least stored the password securely, like they're not in plain text. And if they're stored securely, like if they're hashed and salted properly, then it means that an attacker, even though they have the file, they do still need to guess the passwords but they now have an unlimited number of attempts. So there's not gonna be any lockout because they're guessing offline. And I mean, the ideal protection in this scenario is that we just don't leak the passwords of all your users. Uh, so next, and next again. <laughs> um, so when we give the advice uh, that you say your password has to expire every 90 days, there's usually two things we're trying to protect against or that we think this might protect against. And the first one is that you don't want the attacker to have continued access to your account. And the second one is to try and get ahead of the attacker. So I'll just explain the first one first. So to stop continued access to your account, well, there's two issues with this. Firstly, if we don't know the attacker is there, then they can very easily set up a backdoor. And that backdoor can be as simple as changing the recovery email. Because we don't know there's been a breach, we aren't going to securely check through all these things. And the second thing is if it's your bank account or your card details, like say it's on like Amazon or something like that, then they've already got the, like they've done the damage. So it's not really actually providing much of a benefit in the aftermath. Um, and then the second idea is to try and get ahead of the attacker. So um, the idea is that let's say an attacker is guessing all my password, all the passwords offline, they finally get through offline, they go back to use the password, you know, at the website and oh, well, you've since changed the password. So you're still secure. And the next slide, I'll explain why this isn't very effective. <laughs> And the reason is that we are incredibly predictable when we're asked to change our password. So because uh, you might like be asked to make a password, you might put a bit of effort in to make a good password, but if you know it's gonna expire in 90 days time, you're probably just gonna make like predictable changes to the password each time because it's gonna be so difficult to remember it. And uh, these researchers, Zhang et al, they realized that they could break future passwords based on passwords uh, past passwords in 41% of the accounts they tried in less than three seconds. And with more time, they could get more passwords as well. Um, so yeah, so just a few conclusions from this. Firstly, the password advice we collected is contradictory. So it's not that easy to say, this seems like a good idea. It actually needs research to show that there's security benefits. And a lot of the advice we collected doesn't represent best practice. So this NIST um, documentation literally says, do not force your users to expire their passwords. It's not helpful. And yet places still do. And the last thing is that passwords are just one part of a system. And often it's easier for an organization to make really strict rules for their users rather than actually protecting the password file or limiting the number of wrong guesses. Um, so we need to direct our energies towards things that are beneficial.
Thanks. Thanks so much, Hazel. Um, really interesting presentation and definitely something that I'm guilty of is just using very, very pretty little passwords all the time. So it's something I'll consider a bit more in the future. Thank you. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Sanobar Farin Memon. Uh, Sanobar is based in UL also. Uh, so Sanobar, I'll hand over to you whenever you're ready. Um, thank you, Sean, and uh, thanks to uh, Triple E Women and Engineering UQL Station and Confirm Center for giving me the opportunity for this talk. And um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Anubar Farheen Mehman. I'm a PhD researcher in Optical Fiber Sensor Research Center at Electronic and Computer Engineering Department, University of Limerick, Ireland. And uh, today I'll be talking about Industry 4.0 prospects of optical fiber sensing for biofuel processing industry. Um, next slide, please. So here I'll be talking about biothanol production, optical fiber sensing, and how it connects with Industry 4.0 uh, manufacturing trend. So it is well known that ethanol is one of the key chemicals used in industrial sector and consumer products, such as pharmaceuticals, cosmetics, and personal care products, chemical products, and also um, we, we have alcohol in food products and beverages. So um, since few decades, uh, interest in use of ethanol as a renewable fuel has also been revitalized and being a high demand chemical, there is an ever growing need for its real time measurement in different sectors, especially in biofuel production and processing industry. Bioethanol is actually produced using various means of biomasses and currently production of bioethanol using algal masses is under research which produces third generation of biofuels. You can see on top left, uh, sorry, uh, bottom left of this slide, um, uh, where it represents main elements of this chemical process. This involves uh, cyanobacterial algae, uh, sunlight, carbon dioxide, water, and nutrients. With this method, the initial rate of production of bioethanol is in the range of 0.1 to 0.5 gram per liter per day, which is very, very minute, requiring highly sensitive sensors and real time of measurement in, uh, of ethanol in bioreactors in order to avoid the sample loss because ethanol is highly volatile compound and to optimize the chemical production process and ethanol yield. Hence, my research encompasses development of optical fiber sensors for monitoring uh, production or evolution of ethanol in modern industrial bioreactors. So now the point is why we are using optical fiber sensors for this purpose, because optical fiber sensors have various advantages, such as the capability of translating a change in surrounding environmental signal or analyte into optical signals and transmitting that information about the required parameter in real time. They also have advantages such as immunity to electromagnetic interference, inexpensive implementation, possibility of remote sensing, and they are small in size, they are lightweight and can provide higher sensitivity. This is why they have a great potential to become an integral part of Industry 4.0, which is the current manufacturing trend. For an example, in the center of this slide, I have uh, shown a schematic of Industry 4.0 for bioproducts manufacturing. As you can see, a microalgal biorefinery have several processes, such as seed culturing, processing, production and photobioreactor, dewatering, uh, product extraction, and packaging. And a controller here is used to receive information and log it to database. And database also collects data from network of sensors, which can provide the data regarding different processes. This could allow the operators to monitor the algal growth and biofuel production in real time. Going a step further in this process, this data can help in creating a digital twin of the facility and proper data analysis can help predict future yield and adjust the operations seeing the demand. So it can be established here that industry 4.0 for biofuel manufacturing is based on real time data from sensors. So my research on optical fiber sensors for ethanol sensing can aid to the smart manufacturing and optimizing production of bioethanol using LA. Next slide, please. So uh, in this slide, I'll be talking about current research and uh, future interests. Um, on the right side of the slide, I have added diagrams from my published work, and you can see a schematic of a UVN plastic optical fiber sensor, which shows the transmission of light in it and how it escapes from fiber to interact with the analyte. And below this, there is a picture of the sensor's linear response to very small changes in ethanol corresponding to initial bioethanol production using LU. 
Currently, I'm working on development of optical fiber ethanol sensors to be implemented in actual culturing and production environments. And if you would like to read more about my research, my research kit and Google Scholar links are provided here. And for any future research and project collaborations, I'll be very interested in the fields of optical fiber sensors, IoT sensors, um, industry 4.0 and artificial intelligence. Uh, you can contact me on sanobar.fahin at ul.ie or you can contact me on my LinkedIn with Sanobar Fahin name. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Sanobar. Uh, again, excellent presentation. So thank, thank, thanks a million for, for delivering that today. Um, moving on to our next speaker, uh, I'd like to welcome Diane Hassett. Uh, Diane is a PhD student based at the University of Limerick. So Diane, I'll hand over to you whenever you're ready. Okay, thanks, Sean. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks very much for having me today. And um, so I'm a first year PhD student in Confirm and I'm working on human values in smart manufacturing. And I suppose my own background, um, I suppose I'm coming from 15 years engineering experience in um, medical device manufacture. And I suppose, you know, within that, we would have looked at reimagining, you know, both incremental and transformational changes within smart manufacturing. So this presentation is really around um, first year PhD. So it's really just around looking at um, where we're at in terms of human values and um, smart manufacturing. So if you want to go to the next slide, Sean. So why should we care um, and why should software engineering care about human values? Um, really, first of all, you know, let's talk about what human values actually are. So um, interestingly enough, we've touched on a few of the topics this morning. So things like privacy, security. Um, autonomy, sustainability, but there's also the other side of it in terms of authority and um, equality and fun. They're all human values are all personal to each of us. We have our own values. We have our own values that we prioritize, but our organizations and societies also have values as does our software. So it's just trying to take a look at that. And really, you know, the question I'm kind of asking, are human values another requirement or is there another way of looking at these? So to look in, into this here is really taking a smart manufacturing application of the augmented reality headset and looking at the application within a training and maybe remote maintenance application. So if you want to just turn on to the next slide there. So we're all, oh, no, back one. Oh, okay. So, okay, sorry. Okay, just go back one minute, sorry. Yeah. So we're all familiar um, with, you know, the, the requirements in terms of business requirements and user requirements, but how do we ask questions about what human values the software we should have? And if you take something like the um, AR headset, you know, if you take that for a novice user, it's going to be very useful for getting them up to speed in terms of training and um, gaining their confidence and um, ensuring that, you know, a task has been executed correctly. But on the other side of that, if you look at it from an expert user point of view, are we potentially threatening their autonomy in terms of what they can actually do with, with um, the headset and how much freedom they have as well? So sometimes by if we're not considering human values as requirements, we're not necessarily having the critique and the conversations around exploring those values and how they're used. So we can potentially impact future acceptance um, of the technologies. But also the fact that while we use them in smart manufacturing applications, there's other more global societal implications of using these technologies and um, that we need to consider. And by, I suppose, arming our software engineers with having those conversations in the early stages, we might mitigate against future consequences. So if you go to the next slide, so far, the real the challenges so far are really around four areas what values, whose values, the visibility of these values, and then the representation of those values themselves. So whenever we talk about what values, there is many, many different values we can have, but they're quite subjective. Um, and we also, they're very relevant to context. Um, and everybody has their own value priorities, as I've said. And then we talk about whose values. So one of the things here that's really kind of come into light is it's not just about the stakeholders involved and the organizations and the users within those organizations, but it's also people on the other side, essentially, of the glasses. So the people who are being watched or being viewed or part of those teams and what are their values and how do we maybe um, explore some of that aspect of it. In terms of the visibility of values, then this is really around. Um, if we're not having these conversations about values as requirements, then it, potentially they become implicit in the design. Um, and it's really about how do we make these explicit? 
um, and capture those. And then the representation of values, the headset is kind of a nice example because it kind of gives us that phys physical aspect of it in terms of you can look at it from a design point of view, but also then to go into the interactive software part of it as well as the software behind it. So to explore really where le which, le which levels the values are relevant to. So um, I suppose there is challenges there in terms of if we want to represent values um, and requirements offer a way to do it but it is actually going it's quite complex um, and we're not there yet so if you go on to the next um slide so what are the opportunities i suppose some of the positive side is is there is best practices out there um but they're not operationalized they're not systematically addressed within software and design processes and really what i'll be focusing on is really how can um how can this work help software engin engineers intervene in the conversations and start the conversations around these and um, really to look at how do we make the software for a better world okay so that's mine and um, i'd like to thank you all and and happy to take any questions later on Thanks so much, Diane. It's a really, really interesting uh, uh, take on smart manufacturing, you know, bringing the human side to it. So thanks for your presentation. It's really interesting. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Pire Prezada. Um, Pire is based in the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, I believe. I hope I got that correct. Uh, so Pire, I'll hand over to you um, whenever you're ready. Um, hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Pire. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah, okay, yeah. that's great. Um, so yeah, I'm a PhD student and I'm in my final year. And sorry if you hear background noise, there's some construction going on. Um, so yeah, so I'll be talking about my PhD research, which is on smart homes um, for elderly to promote um, health and well-being. Uh, within that, I am mostly looking on the physiological, uh, monitoring physiological vital signs. Uh, so that's why it is automated remote pulse oximetry system. Next slide, please. So um, I'm looking to monitor at, I've created a system to monitor heart rate and blood oxygen level remotely. So without having sensors on the body. And for this purpose, I'm using um, Connect, um, which is a sensor-based camera system. Um, and then um, I'm working with Beyond Medics as well, which provides imaging and sensing platforms um, for um, patients and um, clinics. So basically the idea is that the um, Connect sensor would be in the environment and participants or um, generally people or patients can be sitting around or walking around and these vitals will be um, taken remotely. Next slide, please. Um, so currently this is being done by using a, a wearable pulse oximeter, which is clipped on a person's finger, and that indicates if the vitals are within, within the normal range or not, and a clinician or generally a person can um, get to know if, if they need uh, help or not. Um, so this has some problems. So for example, one of the problems that it has to be physically worn by a person to be able to identify if they need immediate help or not. Uh, it can be difficult to work with uh, people or patients uh, with physical or cognitive challenges. Um, it can also be movement restrictive and can be cumbersome for wearing long periods of time. Next slide, please. Um, along with that, there's also one other problem that um, in, in a clinical or a triage setting, um, each person has to physically wear this um, device in order to um, know if they need immediate help. Um, while remote pulse oximeter system, the prototype system is able to monitor six people's vitals at a time um, and shows heart rate and oxygen levels um, on the system and can alert um, clinicians um, or emergency services if within home, um, if, if they need assistance. Next slide, please. So this is just a lab demo um, that we did is um, showing that heart rate and blood oxygen levels on the screen along with the error bar as well, um, which shows how reliable the reading is. Uh, it takes a few seconds uh, for um, the data to be captured. It takes, um, uh, it calculates heart rate and blood oxygen using face data. So that's why the face data is being shown. It doesn't record any data. So being privacy sensitive as well. Um, next slide, please. So the key applications are um, for elderly uh, who require uh, monitoring within their homes, 
or isolated or in early stages of dementia. It can also be used at hospitals um, and also at hospitals at home, uh, care homes and psychiatric hospitals. Next slide, please. So um, currently we are doing a, a research study to validate the system where the application can be downloaded uh, from Microsoft Store in Windows 10 computer or Xbox One. Uh, and commercial Pulsox Clip and Connect is being sent to the participant within the UK. Um, we, we handle the costs and we just send them. Um, they, all they have to do is plug, plug the Connect in and um, download the application and it collects infrared, color and depth images of the face. Um, and of course that's post-processed um, on, on the server side um, where forehead, um, cheeks and lips regions, regions of interest are used to calculate these vitals. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a UI of showing um, how the application looks like. And even though it's uh, not visible to the naked eye as the heart rate um, beats, uh, skin is flushing lighter and uh, darker and brighter over time. And that's the concept that um, we're using to calculate these vitals. And if anybody wants to sign up, if they're in the UK, um, they can. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, and thank you. Next slide. Um, and yeah, if anybody wants to get in touch um, or um, collaborate, um, you can contact me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barry. That's a really, really interesting, uh, interesting presentation and research that you're doing there. So uh, best of luck with the project. Um, next up, we have, sorry, my PowerPoint is frozen again. Uh, it's our last speaker for, for today, and uh, last but not least, obviously. Uh, I'd like to welcome Mariana Hugo Silva, again from the University of Limerick. And um, so, Mariana, whenever you're ready, please, you, you can go ahead. I'm ready. Okay, so uh, good morning, good afternoon to you all. So my name is Mariana, and I'm here to present my work. And my talk today is entitled The Potential Impact of Long-Acting Injectables on Worldwide Health. So next slide, please. So first, uh, let's start with a little bit of introduction of what is a long-acting injectable. So it's a drug formulation that forms depot uh, when injected into the body. And the drug is released for uh, slowly and uh, over a sustained period uh, for more than one week. And these can be injected subcutaneous or intramuscularly. So uh, as you can see in the figures. Uh, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> So uh, the, the formulation technology is being developed in, uh, taking into account the areas of greatest need and also the areas of greatest impact. Next slide, please. So the challenge uh, uh, in this presentation, I choose to focus in the contraception um, uh, in the conceptive, uh, contraceptive area. So challenges, we have uh, more than 220 million women in developing countries that have uh, that lack access to modern contra contraceptives, leading to an estimated 80 million women with an intended pregnancy. And so what is opportunity for us that we are trying to develop new drugs and new formulations and new, uh, new ways to get medicines to the, um, to the patients. Uh, reduction of unintended pregnancy by 17%. Uh, so as a consequence of this, uh, the maternal death will drop by 67%. Newborn death will drop by 77%. And uh, there are a lot of studies that support that when women have the ability to time and space their pregnancies, it unlocks a virtuous cycle of prosperity for families and countries. So when contraceptives are included in the national plans of the countries, you see uh, economical rise and prosperity in this. So thanks. <laughs> Can you please? Okay, perfect. So uh, that's what uh, ARC is currently in the marketing, uh, market. So you will already have six months injectable. So the effect of the contraceptive lasts for six months. But still in these countries, it's quite difficult for women to go to the village doctor. And sometimes it's difficult to have like a sufficient staff for other women that want to get to these. So uh, then, uh, next slide please, <laughs> sorry. Sean. And then um, we have, uh, we increased the, the drug release for one uh, to two years in a bioresorbable implants. So this uh, is starting to be implemented now. But then uh, what we want and we aim for the future, uh, can you go to the next slide, please? It's uh, 
this is a, a new technology for long acting oral de delivery. So you don't have only one drug that is being delivered. You have the drug that acts as a, a second receptive. You can have other adjuvants that will um, modulate the release of the drug. And you can also have drugs that, um, that can treat other conditions that are common in these populations. Uh, next slide, Jean, please, sorry. Uh, but the goal is to this woman be able to control when they want the contraceptive aspect to be in or not. So uh, the goal is to reach uh, 10 years of reversible birth control with a single implantable device. So the implant is wordlessly activated and deactivated by the user without requiring the, the removal. So it's much more reliable because it doesn't so we already took uh, the, the part of patient compli uh, compliance when we are uh, getting a new uh, long-acting injectable. This will give them some power in terms of when they want to have the pregnancy or not in a more shorter term. And also decreases the burden on healthcare providers that in this country is um, yeah, it's quite difficult and allows women to control their contraception. Uh, next slide, please. So conclusion uh, regarding the long acting technologies, uh, we can improve the adherence by decreasing frequency or simplifying the dose, alleviate the burden on healthcare pro providers, increase patient access, simplify the supply chain and the products must also be, uh, so we have to keep in mind that the products have to be cost effective and affordable within the global health budget constraints. So this is, uh, so you can only get these if academia, industry, and the government work together for these people. So next slide, please. So I want to finish with an uh, African pro uh, proverb that is, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And that's what we are doing. So thank you all today for listening. And yeah, thanks, Ren. <laughs> Thanks so much, Mary. And again, a really, really great presentation. And, and, and thank you very much for, for your input today. So I think that brings us to the end. Let me just. Yeah, that brings, I just wanted to check just to be 100% sure. That brings us to the end of our lightning talks for today. Um, so before we uh, move on to the next portion of the event, I'd just like to sincerely thank all of the speakers. There were some amazing, they, they were all amazing presentations and, and really, really interesting topics that, that you're working on. So thank you for, for sharing that with us. So um, we're running a little bit uh, late this morning. So I, I have a list of questions here that I really want to ask the speakers, but unfortunately I don't think I'm gonna get time. There was one question in the chat uh, that I saw coming through, um, and this was a question for Hazel. So Hazel, it was just on, uh, it's from Sarah there. She asked, um, how reliable are the suggested strong passwords from Google? Can you give any insight on that? Um, so the suggested strong passwords, is, it's essentially a random generator and Google don't store them in any way. So in theory, like they're not recording what passwords they're giving you unless you ask them to as well. And they're restoring it in your browser, not like on their backend servers. So there's some complaints that they're not like strong enough and they don't let you manipulate it in any way to make it better. But generally they're kind of okay. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Thank, thanks so much, Hazel. Um, so the, the, there was no other questions in the in the chat, but I'm sure people have, have, have more that they'd like to talk about. So what we might do now, I'm just conscious there's only 10 minutes left. We might open the breakout breakout sessions, um, if that's okay. So Sean, for the, yeah. hey Sean um, have it for 10 minutes. Um, so yeah. we come and two minutes to conclude. But before that, I would think, should we take a screenshot here, a photo or something before we sure. go into, yeah? Absolutely, no problem. So if, any, if everyone who'd like to be in the screenshot would like to turn on their camera, um, audience included, obviously, uh, and I'll just give it a second there and I'll take a shot for us. Okay. Great. <laughs> that's all done. I did it in trying to get a group photo together in a physical event, for, that's for sure. Um, okay, so will I launch the breakout rooms now, Lubna? Yep, yep, yep. Perfect. So uh, the chairs, sorry now, I'm just, uh, yeah, so the chairs should go directly into the, their respective rooms and then anyone, uh, everyone else on the call is, is free to select which room they'd like to, um, they'd like to join, okay? So I'll open the rooms now and you should get a pop-up on your screen.
Jackie, did you want to go to a room? I can assign you here if you want. Yeah, you may as well put me in cyber security. No, but um, perfect. It just didn't, I didn't get any option. I, yeah, sometimes sometimes it's, um, yeah. it doesn't pop up. I'll, I'll send you in there now, okay? Great. And if anyone else is in the main room and wants to be um, sent to one of the breakout sessions, you can just let me know and I can send you to the room if you like. Welcome back, everyone. <laughs> I'll just wait, wait for the others to, to come back into the main room there. Okay, uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, hope the breakout sessions went well. I was out here, I didn't get to join one, unfortunately, but I uh, hope the discussions went well. And, so this is this kind of marks the end of the event. Um, so before we finish up, I'd just like to draw your attention. I've shared a link in the chat box there um, to just a quick evaluation uh, questionnaire. So if you could take the time to fill that out, that would be fantastic. It'll only take a minute, uh, two minutes maximum. Um, I'd just like to sorry. thank- Sorry, oh, sorry, Sean, I don't see the link. I'm not sure oh. if everyone else does. Sorry, link. I'll share it. It's because I shared it, I think, before you- Yeah, it's just popped in there now again. You see it popped in the chat there. Perfect. Thanks, Susan. Um, so just to thank all of the speakers, um, both the keynote speakers and the lightning, uh, the speakers for the lightning talks, they were really, really fantastic. I thought the extremely interesting for someone who's not actually doing research in STEM myself. I found them very, very interesting and uh, there's some excellent uh, work being carried out. I'd also like to thank Lobna um, for organizing this event and also Nagam from, from IEEE for, for organizing it from the IEEE side as well. It's much appreciated and uh, really enjoyed being part of it. So thanks again to everyone and uh, we'll leave it there thanks, for today. Thank, thank you so much. Much. Thanks. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.